Um, so Jason, I'm gonna uh, take an attempt at, at introducing you here. Um, okay. I, I have uh, uh, sufficiently creeped on your profile online on your website, so I think that I've got a a good um, a good entry point for an intro here. So our esteemed uh, panelist or presenter this evening is Jason, and Jason is it Wraith? It's actually Rathy. Rathy. So now we all know Rathy uh, is Jason's last name. And Jason is a co-owner. Um, co-owner, you started. You started the business with Shannon. Yeah, I'm actually the owner now. Okay, great. Uh, so Jason owns um, Field Outdoor Spaces. They are a uh, landscape design and installation uh, firm uh, that is based here in the Twin Cities. And uh, Field Outdoor. Jason's also involved, uh, and part of the reason we. Um, well, Emily got connected with Jason was that he is a co-chair of uh, Main Street Alliance, Minnesota, uh, which is a, 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 that's one of the many community groups. Uh, thank you. And if you want to, if you want to talk more about Main Street Alliance, uh, Jason, that'd be, that'd be great. Uh, just to kind of give folks a, um, a, a benchmark for some of the other community work that you're doing. Sure. Um, but we invited Jason here today, y'all, um, to talk with us uh, about uh, community beautif beautification through landscape design, plantings, trees, you name it, all the beautiful green stuff and uh, landscape around the uh, cooperatives uh, that you all own and manage. Um, and Jason, I will kick it off to you. Um, Jason's going to give me a little bit of time here at the end to talk about um, some low cost like signage and um, other beautification tools that um, that that we've picked up as a team here at NCF over the years uh, that co-ops can employ to help uh, pretty quickly uh, do some beautification and enhance their curb appeal. So he's going to leave me a few minutes on the end here. Uh, but with that, I will uh, kick it off to Jason. Jason, if there's anything else about your background or anything uh, context that would be helpful for folks on the on the call tonight to to know about you, please feel free. Um, but that's my that's my introduction. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, super happy to be here. Uh, really excited. Yeah, I didn't even think about the Main Street Alliance uh, connection. The Main Street Alliance is a business owner and business leader organization that is trying to fill the void. Uh, where the voice is needed for small businesses that doesn't just have to do with lower taxes and less regulation. Um, so we lend our voice to a lot of different issues at the local level, uh, state level and national level. Um, a lot of it just really has to do with the, the fact that our businesses survive based on strong communities. And so our, I think we lend our voice to all those things that build strong communities, build strong, families because you know 99% of what a business is is the employees I have 22 employees um, employees make everything happen there's no no way that the, a business survives and and thrives without that and and that's for me that's been most of the issues that I've been most involved with is issues of uh, that have to do with uh, employees I mean so healthcare. Um, Earn Sick and Save Time, which is a big one in Minneapolis a few years ago. So that's the Main Street Alliance. Um, I can give just a little background on myself, but would we have time to do kind of a little round robin and have people talk about uh, who they are, where they're from, and what they hope to get out of tonight? Is that possible, Tori, Emily? Yeah, I, I think that we've got 12 participants here and um, most folks know who NCF staff are, and we make up like four of the 12, and you're five, so we've only got seven people to get through. So yeah, let's okay. do it. Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead and call on people. Um, so let's start with Park Plaza. Pat, you wanna go ahead? Hi, I'm Pat Streeter. I, I am a resident at Park Plaza Cooperative in Fridley, Minnesota. Um, and I'm also currently serving on the board of directors at NCF. Um, I have been appreciating more this summer the <laughs> curb appeal um, and the credibility that I believe it gives our co-op when the signage is professional. Um, there's nice plantings around the signs. Um, and 
I, I just appreciate that professional look about it. Um, I've been trying to do the last few years some gardening along the boulevard of where my home is. Um, and I think I need to do something different with that next summer. So I'm kind of thinking that over a little bit, but so thanks. Glad to be here. Okay. Thanks, Pat. All right, Natividad and Bonnie. Hope you're on mute. All right, we have a, uh, it's just for me. This is just for you. You're introducing yourself and okay. talking a little bit about. I'm Bonnie Johnson, a treasurer at Park Plaza Co-op. And I've been here 20 years, going on 21. And uh, we're doing a lot of uh, beautification on our boulevards. And some of them are very nice. And people are fixing up their houses. And, and it's looking real nice now for fall. And I love flowers, and everybody is putting got the flowers out, the ones that take care of the yard. And we just and getting along pretty good this summer here with all our, our uh, mobile homes, trying to fix them up. Thanks, Bonnie. Okay. I'm Natividad Seafeld, president of Park Plaza Cooperative <laughs> in Fridley, and um, I'm on this beautification because I want a better front entrance. <laughs> But um, Bonnie and I have planted the plants and the flowers, uh, usually in the front entrance. We put in flowers. The hosta that are there right now currently came out of my garden from almost 22 years ago. So they are pretty old and I transferred them over to the front entrance. And then on the back side, decided to put perennials in there so that they can collect bees and butterflies and hopefully they'll do well. And then we have four garden boxes on the side of our office. And uh, I stuck perennials in there as well. And then some of the residents planted some jalapeno plants. So we have uh, a resident who's doing awesome job with gigantic bell peppers. And she did that on her boulevard. And Pat's garden's nice and tall. And then she has a beautiful garden right next door to her. And then there's some down the way. So they're able to utilize their boulevards. On my side, we only have streets. So we have to put everything in pots. But it still, it still makes people try and do that. And, it, it's a welcoming feeling. So we would just like more information on how to um, upscale the entrances a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Intividad. Carlton, do you just want to quick introduce yourself and what your role is on the board? Oh, That's Carlton. Okay. Oh, here he goes. He's got there you go. You got me? <laughs> we got gotcha. you. Okay, uh, Carlton Dahl, uh, director at large. I've been here around 10 years or so. Uh, got here, well, probably five, six months before it became a co-op. Uh, uh, our uh, grass cutters around the park did a wonderful job. I was glad of that. That's about it. Okay, thanks, Carlton. Okay, let's move on to Camel Creek. And we'll, well, let's make these intros just a little bit zippier so that we can get to the, to the, um, to Jason's talk here. So let's talk, let's start with uh, Peggy. Peggy, you're on. Hi, Peggy Claflin, Pamel Creek Estates Property Management. Um, we've done a lot of road work, so we're still in the process of beautifying Pamel Creek Estate. So anything we can do is only going to help us. I have Jerry here with us. Hi, I'm Jerry, and I'm from Panel Creek Estates, too, and I'm the treasurer. Um, I can see a big improvement in our park since you, we went by you, and I'd like to see more. And I think our park is a great park. So, Thanks, Peggy. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Yep. Thanks. All right. Bobby? Hi, I'm Bobby Grubb from Pamela Creek Estates. I'm the board secretary and I just want to learn how to make our place look more attractive and beautiful. Like Peggy said, we've had a lot of road work done so and still doing it. So just making it look more attractive and plants and flowers and everything else. Great. Thanks for joining Bobby. And we've got, I don't know where Amy or Danny are coming from. 
I'm Danny, and I'm from Pamel Creek. Danny from Pamel Creek. Okay. Danny. Yeah. And I'm I'm a resident. I'm a new resident. I've been here for a few months now and kind of, you know, been having fun beautifying the front and sides of my my place and enjoying all the changes and updates that they're doing here. It's I love being here. So great. So Danny, you're not on the board. That's awesome. We love it when nine board members join for these things. That's great. So thank you for joining. And Amy? Absolutely. Hi, I'm from Pamel Creek. I'm relatively new to the board. I'm a member at large. Um, this park has, I've been here almost two years and it's gotten a lot prettier since I've been here and it'd be awesome to find some more tips to make it even better. Excellent. And I you know, my kids, are crazy and they'll bug me in a minute sure that's all right i think we got through everybody um and we've got ncf staff but we've been been doing introductions throughout the time so let's we'll kick it back to you jason okay yeah sounds great thank you for doing that that, that helps me try to always do that when i do a in-person uh presentations is just get a sense of what people are looking for and i think uh, as we go through Definitely ask questions uh, via chat or just uh, just jump right in. Um, I think probably one of the one of the best things will just be um, asking the things that are on the top of your mind as I kind of move through things. Uh, a little bit more about me and my background. So yeah, Field Outdoor Space is a company that started 16 years ago. Mostly we do residential, um, small yard residential design. So day in day out. I work with clients probably 70 a year or something like that um, to go and talk to them about their their space, their home space, and yeah, figure out the same things that you're looking for is how do you how do you beautify it? How do you create a space that's safe and calm and um, places to gather, um, create community? So I love I've always loved the community aspect of what I do. Um, I always particularly loved front yards where you know that kind of interface to the public space. Um, so I think that uh, in the spaces that you're in, it seems like a really, there's some really cool opportunities. I've also been part of, you know, garden clubs, Bryn Mawr Garden Club, and done a lot of different things where one tries to organize volunteers. And um, so I've seen that. We also do a lot of rain gardens um, for municipal or kind of school areas and, and organize volunteers. And so I have, I'm really familiar with how how those can work and not work. So if that's a topic that is of interest, I have some thoughts on those things too. Um, I also am just a huge lover of trees. Um, me and and a business owner friend of mine started a nonprofit uh, four years ago um, called the Autonomous Collective. We um, we plant trees for people in North Minneapolis in their um, on their in their yards, uh, which has been really fun and. We also, as a company, started working for the city of Woodbury last year, just specifying uh, what trees to plant and where to plant them. Um, so it's definitely a, a passion of mine as well. And I know that for you and your places, uh, trees are are one of the main issues. So we can talk we can talk a lot about that. All right, let me uh, get into it. Um, let's see if I can make sure that I can. Oh, there we go. Um, so I'm going to keep it like really kind of base level and just make sure that kind of break it up into what I see as the main categories of beautification or of um, maintaining, you know, the landscapes that you have. Um, so kind of keep it to like, what can you do? You know, what should you do? What are kind of better things than other things? And then also um, get into exactly how you do it. So um, I like getting into the nuts and bolts pragmatic, you know, what do I need? Tools, water, um, and things like that. So uh, again, I move through. So I just, thanks to Tori, she kind of gave me some uh, different pictures. That helps me just to kind of get a, a sense. And I do this with clients too, is when I meet with them, usually I start with their, uh, with what they have now. And it just kind of grounds us in um, what, <laughs> What we're working with, what's the, the main elements um, that are there. Obviously, uh, looking at these pictures, lawn and trees um, are a main element just as boards as you're kind of thinking about, 
you know, investment in either tree, um, tree replacements, uh, you know, managing the tree community. So I'm going to break it down into trees first. We'll talk a little bit about um, trees, what, why trees are important, uh, different aspects of trees, and then uh, talk about uh, planting trees and what uh, different ways to look at planting trees. And then very shortly, <laughs> we talk about lawn. Um, I can answer questions on lawn, but probably lawn is just kind of lawn. And um, if you have questions on it, we can certainly take that, uh, take those, you know, afterwards. Or, but I'm going to probably move on past that fairly quickly. Uh, then we're going to shrubs um, and the different um, things that you can do with shrubs. And then we'll end with kind of, uh, I think the most fun, but uh, um, is flowering plants. Um, doing seasonally flowering plant communities. And I think uh, I'm gonna use the, the example of planting around a sign as, as kind of a specific project for that. And look at what are the different ways that you could approach that. Uh, kind of talk about how you do um, kind of full, full planting, which is what we really love, but also kind of go through why one might in different um, places do a gravel bed um, approach. And then hopefully from there, we can just dive wherever you want. I mean, um, I'm a huge plant person. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time in our company uh, thinking about plants. We're probably on the, out of all landscape companies, on the very high end of um, how important plants are to our designs. We, we custom grow plants. We have a plant sale in June where we have specific communities of plants that we um, design. Uh, from and then we we have a plant sale that we sell all those plants to both our clients and other other people so plants are just a huge part of what we do and it's very easy for me to get excited about it so the trees um and here we can just you know kind of talk about trees trees are the first thing that i always talk about every time that i walk um, onto somebody's property for a consultation my first thing that i do is i look up and look at the trees um what do they have? What's the state of the trees? Are they healthy? What are the species, which would also indicate whether they might be healthy um, in the next 10 years. And so I think it's logical to start there um, for you too. There's lots of tree issues out there. Obviously the last um, 40 years, we've kind of moved through several um, really devastating tree um, epidemics, you know, starting with Dutch elm, uh, back in the 70s um, and we've kind of moved through every 20 or 30 years to kind of another one and right now we're um, in the in the middle of emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is going to probably wipe out large portions of our ash trees and ash trees I'm sure is a major component of, of most of your woods. Um, ash trees in the 80s I mean it was 40% of nursery sales was ash trees, all the way up to when they were required to stop selling ash trees, they had to just burn off, you know, the whole nursery stock of them because it was still 40%. So you can imagine how many ash trees were planted in that time. There's certain uh, municipalities that have 70% of their um, forest that's uh, ash. So it's a major, major issue um, right now. And so, uh, replacement of trees and getting the new next tree community is really important. Um, I have a couple other ones on here. One is a um, blue spruce. Blue spruce tend to um, get some foliar diseases when they, you know, get to 40 years old or something. And my guess is probably you're seeing some of that in your communities as well. And then on the bottom is actually a oak wilt. Um, oak wilt is also a devastating disease of oak trees. Um, and I think oak trees is, to me, kind of the most important part of a lot of our woods. And I'm a huge advocate for people planting oak trees. So, so yeah, so there's lots of issues out there that, that you're going to find um, that could wipe out, you know, parts of your, your woods um, that you're, you know, that you cultivated over time. Um, as we look to uh, what do we do in terms of replacing them? I think the biggest thing is just to start planting now and plant a lot 
um, wherever you can. I mean, I think that's that's really the big the big thing. The rule these days on planting is to plant is the 30 20 10 rule, which is don't plant more than 30 percent of any plant family, and don't plant more than 20 percent of any plant genus, and don't plant more than 10 percent of any specific um, specific plant. So the one that is is becoming the uh, the ash of the of uh, you know the last 20 years um, is um, is uh, is maple um, and specifically autumn blaze maple. Autumn blaze maple in nurseries is sold you know in 20 30 percent um, of trees sold, um, and so it's it's a tree that generally when we're talking to people it's you'd want to to plant as little as you could. There's probably already a bunch of them, you know, in the surrounding community. Um, and so we definitely advocate for trying to reach out to um, plant other things, have a really good um, variety of things. I look at trees as, um, there's small trees, medium trees, and, and then what I call legacy trees. You'd always start with a legacy tree if you could. Um, you know, these are the trees that, you know, an ash tree was a legacy tree, elm legacy tree, uh, maples are legacy trees. So these are trees that grow 40 to 70 feet tall, um, just become, you know, the major um, part of nature in our, in our world. Um, there's lots of good legacy trees. Obviously, they're going to take um, a little bit more time to, um, to grow. But I always say, if you can plant an oak, you should plant an oak. Um, it always should be the top of the list of um, any planting. Um, and if you're planting five trees, make sure that, to me, I would think, make sure at least one is an oak. There are good, uh, people always think about oaks as slow growing trees, which is generally true. Um, but a swamp white oak is actually a medium growth rate tree. So it'd be pretty similar to, to probably an ash tree um, where it's gonna grow, you know, two and a half, three feet a year. Um, so I think there's good, good choices there. But plants like hackberry, um, basswood, um, buckeye, which I, is, I put on the medium tree list too, but um, lots of good trees. But I think it's just, yeah, kind of continuously trying to keep diversity um, in your plantings. On the evergreen side, uh, generally would recommend uh, avoiding as much as possible um, Colorado blue spruce. Uh, one, it, it is a tree that really struggles in Minnesota. Um, it just really doesn't like the humidity um, that we have in the summers. Way spruce is a fantastic, one of my favorite trees. Um, would be a really similar tree. Black Hills spruce would also be a really good spruce. Uh, white pine, fantastic. And even plants like Eastern Red Cedar, which in some of your communities, you may just have it seeding in. It's a, it's a native plant that, um, that readily comes into disturbed areas, um, but it's a great plant for birds and um, a good windbreak plant as all the evergreens would be. And then on the uh, medium size um, trees, you kind of get in these trees that are a little faster growing. They might be short lived, but I think they have a really great place in our, um, in our natural environments too. Things like birch, uh, blue beech, aspen, buckeye, you know, I put on there because it's, it takes so long to um, get tall that even in, you know, 15 years, it's probably only going to be 15, 20 feet tall. Um, I love that. It's a great tree. And then small trees too, again, it's, it's easy to kind of think about like, oh yeah, a maple, an oak, but small trees can be just really fantastic, um, close to buildings, under power lines, in groupings of, you know, five, 10 trees to create a little bit of a um, little woods, um, great for bird. Uh, service berry is a wonderful native plant uh, that the birds will eat all the fruit off of. And cherry is actually a really great tree, um, especially if you're looking for an edible, you know, plant, which can be a kind of a nice community um, asset. Cherry is the best because it requires the least work. As you'd move into apples or something, you're kind of starting to get into a hobby. But a cherry tree just kind of takes care of itself. It would be what we would count as a true landscape plant that you put it in and 
it just kind of does its thing and and it fruits and it looks really nice in the winter um not very many disease problems and so there's a lot of good cherry trees for that try to go so so what would you need to to have a tree planting um obviously a shovel uh a hose a place to get water from which sometimes might be a little bit challenging and then we'd probably recommend using a gator bag i have a, a gator bag on there just makes watering easier so if each tree you put in you put that gator bag on there you get to the point you probably just water it twice a week um fill that bag up and um water it twice a week those are really nice for um this type of planting and i say that i learned this from working in garden clubs actually is a no matter what you do in terms of beautification, spend as much time and money and allocate time going forward for the maintenance of it. Um, so the maintenance of, of this and, and most plantings, a lot of it's the establishment watering and making sure they're healthy. But trees, uh, research shows with trees that if you water it and maybe fertilize it a little bit, it could grow twice as fast and be twice as healthy. And so continuing to water trees throughout their lifespan is actually really important. The other thing that you'd want to do with a tree if you plant once you planted it is, is do a mulching. Um, mulchings are there for a couple reasons. Uh, one, they hold moisture, um, making the root system uh, healthier. But the other thing, and probably the most important thing, is that they they make it so that lawn crews don't use a weed whip next to the tree um a weed whip next to the tree anything that actually wounds a tree when it's young will just become bigger and bigger and bigger um over time so you want to be really careful not to um not to wound the bark of trees when they're young the uh the other thing on this tree in the middle you can see it has that white um protector on it uh especially for soft bark trees. Um, so service berry would be one of them. Um, actually a cherry tree would be one of them. One of two of the actually most damaging things um, for trees is winter damage. Um, specifically rabbits eating all the bark off of it and deer uh, rubbing the bark in the fall. And so you'd wanna put those on about now um, every year and either leave them on or take them off. Leave them on, and the problem with leaving them on would be that you could get to the point if you kept leaving it on that the tree would kind of grow around it, which you wouldn't want. Um, a winter protection of trees is, is probably the most important thing of all plant maintenance. Um, you can just, I lost in my house, I, uh, I didn't do that. I have three trees and I lost two of them because um, the rabbits actually ate every bit of bark up for three feet. So really important. And trees come in uh, different sizes. So if you went to the nursery, um, they come in different, in different sizes. On the left, we have a container tree. So it's grown, generally how that's grown, um, might be getting a little nerdy here, but um, is that they actually take a tree and they bare root it. They actually take it out of the ground and cut the roots off um, and store it in a, in a big, huge, um, it's like a hanger, like a big, huge hanger, kind of cool in the winter. And then in the spring, they actually put them in these pots with soil, and then it roots out in the in the container. Um, these are really nice to plant. This is our preferred um, format for tree planting. Um, it's going to be a little cheaper, um, a lot less waste, and also um, they're going to be less heavy. Uh, a B and B is the other option, real traditional way of um, of uh, harvesting trees in the nursery. So how this is done is they actually go in and dig the tree out. So they actually spade they spade the tree and lift it out of the soil. So it's been growing in the in the nursery just in lines. You see this um, as you drive down the road by nurseries, uh, and then they they wrap it in that um, in the burlap, and then they have a, a cage around it. Uh, this I find one is technically very hard to to plant. Uh, you have to cut all that stuff off of there. Um, generally, in planting, you always want to like find the 
the primary root of the tree, which is the, the first part that, that comes out. And you want that right at the top of the soil. Bald and burlap um, trees are, uh, it's very difficult sometimes to find that. It could be five inches, you know, lower. And but then you're just struggling with a, you know, 400 pound ball and whatever. So I think containers would be the right way to go. And research has showed that most trees, when they're planted small, will catch up to trees that are, that are planted a little bit bigger. Um, is really what you want to do is once it roots in, that's when it takes off. And a container tree can do a really great job of rooting in fast. So, so that's kind of my um, trees and planting trees. Does anybody have any questions about trees? We can also. I think Bonnie's, I think you're muted. He wants to know what to do with, um, we have some fairly large trees where the roots are out of the ground. Oh, yeah. So yeah, they so they're, catch the house do, you know, do you know what type of tree they are? No. Yeah. Um, yeah, so roots out of the ground um, can be tree specific. Some trees tend to do it more than other trees. Uh, honey locust is a tree that, um, is a is a uh, is a plant that's a surface rooter. Um, She's thinking it's a maple. Okay, and maples too, especially Norway maple. Um, Norway maple can be can create a whole kind of web of of surface roots. Um, the other thing that can uh, cause that or bring that out more is heavy soils. So a heavy clay soil. Usually, what happens is the roots actually will actually stay higher um, because there isn't as much oxygen in that soil. And so you'll tend to have the roots be higher and higher. Um, that would be really common with a, with a Norway maple. Um, Norway maples also, uh, in terms, I mean, a lot of times where you see it is that you have a really hard time growing grass, you know, because there's so many roots around there. Um, Norway maples have a triple effect on grass because they, um, one, they're super dense um, shade, and so they shade the grass out. And then third, they actually exude a chemical that actually kills plants underneath it too. So Norway maples are one of those that you just end up having dirt uh -huh. under it, and it's super hard to grow things. And you'll see, uh, go ahead. Uh, where the roots are on the outside like that, uh, it tends to continue to grow, and because we're so close uh, house to house, we have issues where it's now hitting, we're having to take them out because it's hitting the gas lines, the central air, and it's uh, going under the house. So that was, that's one of the big issues here. We were built in 1960, so some of these trees are pretty old and oh, tall. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, have you had a tree person look at that at all? Yeah, we had a tree company come out just recently and we picked some that we're taking out now. They're $3,000 to take out, but yeah. we have to because it's damaging the house and the central air and it's so close to the gas lines now. We had one where we couldn't even continue to bring it all the way down to the ground because it was so close to the gas line. Mm. So our concern is once we take these out, how do we get, what types are, are good to put in a community so close together? Where you don't have such big roots. Yeah, so I think it would be avoiding the the logical ones that do that. Um, a lot of trees that are going to be like river um, river bottom trees are going to tend to do that because that's what makes them good at at being in places that the soils move around a lot. Um, so elm would be you know definitely in that category too. Um, I think what you'd want to do is actually look towards things that are deep rooted, like tap rooted. Um, so you'd look at oak, uh, probably walnut, probably uh, Kentucky coffee is a great tree. Um, Kentucky coffee, I think, is a great tree because it also has smaller leaves. Um, so it has kind of a dappled, um, a dappled canopy. Did you want to come visit us? Do I want to what? Come visit us. <laughs> well, you're in Fridley, right? Yes, sir. We oh, are. yeah, you're right up there. We're in Northeast, so Northeast Minneapolis, so you're right up the right up the way. Ten minutes. 
Come on yeah, over. That, that sounds know. fun. <laughs> Well, the other thing is actually smaller trees. Smaller trees are going to not do that at all. I mean, so, I mean, if you look at, like I said, service berry, crab apple, a crab apple could suck her maybe. Um, but a lot of those are, we call this kind of shrub trees, is that they're kind of shrubs, kind of, um, yeah. kind of trees, but they're going to get 25 feet tall. Um, I think a lot of those, actually even like birch, um, birch is kind of a hard plant sometimes. You'd want to put it in a little bit of shade. Um, but that kind of small medium, I think, actually would probably be a good choice, too. Yeah, we're just we're trying to find stuff. Right now we have empty lots with no trees. There's a couple of them, and that's the turnoff for the people to purchase the lot is there is not a single tree. And then, you know, but we're not, we're over sand and stuff, so we we're not sure what to do as far oh. as that. Oh, that's interesting that you have sand. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. It's just we have huge, large well, that's true because you're kind of up on the sand plain. Hmm. Right. Um, yeah, and, and, and there's places for fast growing trees and there's places for slow growing trees. Um, Amur choke cherry is a really nice medium sized tree that grows really fast. Um, you just want to probably then pepper in some more legacy trees so that you have a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Was there another question? Yeah, I, uh, this is Peggy from Hamill Creek. We have silver maples that are the legacy trees. They're 50, 60 feet tall. I mean, they've yep. been here for 60 or 70 years. Um, they're huge with their, with their roots being up, you know, on top, and they break up cement and concrete and roads and everything. Um, this park is plastered with them. We probably have... I would say maybe 50 of these, and it's the only tree that we have. And we've started getting a lot of them where, you know, the, the limbs are 25, 30 feet. They arch over um, yeah. our, our roads, and they become a real danger because during storms um, and, and snow, they break off. Yep. Um, you know, and to, and to get rid of one of these, just one of them, you know, we're looking at $5,000 because they are huge. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that yep. it's a silver maple is another one that is just um, something that should not be in a mobile home park when, you know, the homes are so close and, yeah. and the, the, we're all clay here. And we, we don't have sand, we're all clay. Yeah. Yeah, silver maple is one of the harder trees. You just, yeah, you, you said exactly all the reasons why. Yeah, silver maple was planted, um, was the major tree planted after elm trees died. Um, at that point in time, I mean, like there's parts of, yeah, lots of communities where, yeah, you just look as far as you can see and it's all silver maples. Silver maples are, and what people wanted uh, is they wanted really fast growing trees. Um, and so, this is kind of the legacy of that continuing every generation to want fast growing trees and then the next generation having the same problem is that the trees are really hard to deal with. Um, silver maples, and this is true of I think all fast growing trees, is that they have really soft wood um, and so they tend to drop major limbs, you know, more than other trees. Um, silver maples also have bad structure. Um, so they tend to, um, they go horizontal rather than kind of vertical or Y, you know, Y shape. When we look at a silver maple, we say, oh, that's a nice silver maple. Usually it's because it has a really nice Y shape like the elms used to have. When we have, you know, the branches going um, straight horizontal, uh, that's just a, a, a really bad, you know, situation with that, with that tree. And that's a really hard thing, yeah, for you to deal with with that big of a population of, you know, frankly, dangerous, dangerous trees. I don't know that I have any um, recommendations other than to continue to try to evolve your way out, you know, I mean, with other types of trees over time and maybe take, and I'm sure that you had, <clears throat> you probably have some consultants or you've talked to tree people is, is, is remove where you can, maybe remove removals, 
uh, can vary vastly um, by where they're at. And so a removal that's under a power line or over a power line or right next to a, a building um, or behind a building um, <clears throat> could be $2,000. And, and like you say, you know, a harder one could easily be $5,000. And so, you know, it'd, it'd be nice to kind of have a consultant kind of look at, well, what could, where can we, where can we find ways to, to do this the most efficiently to work our way out to a different plant community over time? It is a long, it's a long process. Yeah. Yeah, silver maple would be, I, I think, the worst unless you had cottonwoods. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. That one's yeah. another one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can't believe when they build things and they keep cottonwoods up, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, we want, we want to have a tree here. Like, yeah, the tree's 80 feet tall. Like, I mean, I don't think that's good for yeah. anybody. And we have the, um, what is it, Arbor Vita? I've got, yeah. we've got two um, that are the Twin Pines. Um, that they're at least 60 feet tall. Oh, yeah. And they're healthy? They're healthy, yeah. It's just that, you know, when we get a good windstorm, they start blowing and and bending. <laughs> it's like, oh, geez. You know? Yeah. It's going to be the storm that breaks them. Yeah, we always call those the cemetery trees. You know, you see when you drive through a rural cemeteries, and there's always, you know, five super tall arborvitaes in there. Arborvitae is a great plant. <laughs> That's so true. Mm -hmm. Lovely, hey, Jason. I need to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> They're right across from my house. <laughs> oh, they, uh, that's. I mean, that's a pretty good plan. I mean, it, I mean, the nice thing about it is it doesn't have really um, big branches. Um, yeah. It doesn't tend to just fall over. Uh, you know, at that height, it's lived that long. It probably doesn't tend to get snow load on it. I mean, that's kind of one of our arbor arborvitaes, arborvitaes things is you get snow load and the branches break. Um, but that's a great plant. So I can see that it's yeah, probably scary at, at that tall. Um, and this is the other thing that about trees for me is that trees are healthiest with other trees. We plant them on their, on their own in the middle of a, you know, on the middle of a plane of an empty plane. That's not how trees grow. And that's not a healthy way to grow trees. You almost always want to grow trees with other trees. And so, um, you know, planting trees in groups of three to five with 10, 12, 20 feet between them is the best because their canopies, so especially like a silver maple, if you let that canopy and silver maple just go wide, it's going to be 60 feet wide too. That's really unhealthy for a tree. But if you grow them yeah. together, they're actually going to get taller and have um, a smaller canopy and be a lot healthier um, and less dangerous over time. Okay. Well, I'm just going to do a little time. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Peggy. I'm sorry. We've had a lot of them topped, um, you know, and, and had them come out last year. But it's, it's, this is going to be an ongoing thing un, until, you know, they get actually cut down. Yeah. Well, yeah, let me move through. Um, I was actually going to say, I was going to suggest, Jason, maybe let's skip to the perennial, like the flowering plants. Yeah. And if we've got some additional time, we can maybe circle back. Is that okay? Yep, that's definitely, I mean, I'll, I'll go through shrubs just because they're just going to be part of it, kind of. But sure. um, so your next kind of uh, line of beautification, I think, would be with shrubs. And shrubs um, have a really good thing is they take up space. So when I'll, I would talk about weeds, uh, shrubs generally do a really good job of, um, of out competing weeds. So the shrub on the left is deer villa that's underneath those aspen. Um, that is a plant we use all the time because it covers space um, and, and things just don't generally grow up in it. The shrub in the top right is aronia, has really great berries, um, also kind of has a nice canopy. And all of these would be good for um, hedges too. And a hedge might be a really nice way to kind of uh, beautify kind of a front, um, uh, road, roadside, you know, area. Um, these are service berries on the bottom. Uh, that, that plant has edible berry that uh, the birds will eat. So um, shrubs would be another um, thing to do. And, you know, this would be kind of a fun community thing if you just had space to, uh, 
to do something is a, is something like a Raspberry Patch. Raspberries do actually a great job when you have space of uh, of keeping out weeds. They just you know keep growing. Um, weeds when when everything about landscaping weeds are kind of the thing that we talk about all the time. Um, can be kind of one of the major parts of uh, of maintenance. Uh, just a couple of things about weeds. So this has to do with like, do you use fabric, you know, underneath your mulch when you plant? Generally, we would never recommend that because almost all weeds come from the top. So um, probably 80% of all weeds are going to be trees and they're going to be maples, elms. Uh, uh, I get another one, but um, they're almost all going to come from the top. And if they come from the top and they weed in, and they root into the mulch and then they root into the fabric, it's just super painful to try to get them back out. Um, there are specific ones that come up, and if you had, you know, previous community that was close, um, like like thistles, um, that might be a good place for a fabric. But what you do is kill them off first, and then plant later. So, so flowering plants. Um, so this is a big thing that uh, for our company, we design plant communities that work, um, and we always say that plant communities because I think. Uh, our goal would be to have a tight plant community um, that just works together to um, to smother out weeds, to be seasonal. Um, and what we look for in plants is plants that that have a full canopy, so all year long. Um, this is a planting that that we did, which I always love the the example here because it has some ornamental grasses, it has some larger perennials. Um, one of them is Amsonia in there. And then it has some colonizing perennials like geranium that uh, that just kind of cover um, cover areas. I love this planting because it also shows that a planting like this can look fantastic all winter long. And so this is middle of winter. And this planting actually, even with two feet of snow, those grasses are still standing up and look really nice. And the planting has a lot of bones still. And, and, um, and so it still has a lot of kind of interest um, throughout the, the winter even. Ornamental grasses are one of your, like one of the best things is for, especially for sun, um, shade, I think you'd probably trade out ornamental grasses for, for hosta, um, kind of in the same way. We generally plant 40 to 60 percent of a plant bed in ornamental grasses, um, just because they have such great structure, they look good, you know, throughout the year. And what you don't want in any kind of planting is to have plants that flower in the spring and then they, they poop out and, you know, the foliage dies and you don't have anything left there anymore. So plants like a salvia or something like that, while you could cut it back, it would come back, you'd have a hole there for a long time. So generally try to, you know, find plants that just stay full all year long. Ornamental grasses are a good part of that. Um, so going into kind of a specific project and just kind of using this as different ways to look at how you'd go about planting. You know, uh, one of them would be to do to do gravel. Um, with gravel, if you're going to do gravel, uh, you would put fabric underneath, actually, because that actually stops the, the dirt from coming up through it. Um, a gravel, the reason you do gravel is that gravel is actually super low maintenance. Um, plants do not come up through gravel, and they don't grow in the gravel until you let a bunch of debris turn into soil at the edge and then and then plants will start to root into it. Generally the gravel planting you keep your plants a little bit more separate, a little bit more space in between them and you choose plants that don't spread. You don't like, so you do shrubs, ornamental grasses and perennials maybe like this allium would be really good, um, sedum would be good. Um, so this can be a really nice low maintenance approach. I could see being really great around a sign and uh, and looking looking awesome all year long. Um, you'd want to use some sort of edging. I'm showing um, plastic edging or poly edging. Um, what poly edging does is stop grass from growing into beds. Uh, alternatively, you could do a mulch um, a mulch bed. So again, mulch bed would not have fabric. It would still have edging to stop the grass from coming in, um, and then. This we would tend to try to plant it as dense as possible, like those that planting that I showed before. And our one of our big things is stop mulching, keep like filling it with plants. Um, a plant community you can get full enough that you don't need to ever mulch again, maybe just a little bit at the front. 
Um, and at that point, I think you can have just a really great community for uh, butterflies and seasonality. Um, and so that would be kind of your other approach. When you start, um, it's going to have some spaces in between, like that picture above. Um, and then as it fills in, you'll have you'll see the mulch less and less. So these are some examples of a, of plantings. Um, this one at the bottom right is actually planted right in the gravel. Um, and the plants there, a uh, little blue stem, really good medium sized grass. Um, it's gonna get really great fall color. Comes up a little late, grasses, you have to be kind of careful that um, you have some that come up a little earlier so you don't have holes in the spring. This other plant that's along with the grasses on the bottom right is a uh, Cumello um, stachys, kind of a weird name, but uh, a fantastic plant. Is that foliage, how like cute and neat and uh, it looks, it looks like that all the time. And so you could plant five of those together and you'd just have this awesome apple green um, leaf, leaf canopy, um, really wonderful plant that uh, we've never had problems with. And that, that's the thing too, is it, these are plants that, are, the ones I'm gonna talk about are, are plants that over time we just don't see a lot of disease, a lot of um, problems with. Uh, the one that's on the slope there, that's the pink and the white, is two different um, types of geranium. Geranium is one of the all-time oh. best garden plants. If you have space in any garden, you could put geranium in there. It's a plant that will spread, but it's not going to run over the top of most things. If it does get to that point, you could actually just grab, grab a handful of it and kind of uh, pull it out. Um, but it has great leaf canopy, prevents weeds from um, growing, nice season, seasonal flowering. This is the really low one. It's kind of, it's called uh, Carmina and Biocoba. Uh, we also use a medium-sized one called Bevins variety, which is probably twice as tall as that. But yeah, I think with these types of plantings, you can get really nice seasonality. This is, um, this is prairie drop seed the, as the grass here. And then that's uh, butterfly weed. Butterfly weed is the best for, for butterflies. Um, it is a short-lived perennial, so probably, um, the one that you planted or the, you know, if you planted five, you probably end up with three the next year, and then you might end up with one the next year. Really worth planting a little bit more every year just because it's so good for monarch butterflies. Wow. Oh, wow. And again, these are kind of all, as a company, we just believe it, you just plant what works. Um, oh, these right. are things that work, goes back to uh, prairie drop seed. The yellow one is actually a, a creeping sedum, so a succulent. Succulents are, are really great um, to fill in spaces in gardens. That's, this is called Kamchaticum. This is my favorite. It's like, a, it's like an oldie but goodie uh, that, I, you know, the nursery doesn't want to sell it because they're so tired of selling it, you know, for 25 <laughs> years. But it's still the best because it grows super fast and it's just super full. It always looks good. Um, this plant that has a little bit of blue on it um, at the bottom is Amsonia uh, Blue Ice. One of the best, best garden plants. You could put this next to a road, put salt on top of it, and it would still look like this every year. Amsonia is one of those uh, plant um, genuses, genera, um, that almost all of them are fantastic. Uh, there's tall Amsonia. They all tend to just be really deep-rooted plants that um, once they get established, they just kind of keep going and going. Yeah, this just kind of shows that we all start with, we all start with something. This is a project that we worked on a few years ago um, in the Wedge community of Minneapolis. And, um, that was the result. So start with one thing and then you build from there. Um, of course, there's other types of things in plants too. I'm just going to zip through this kind of fast. I mean, um, you know, community areas doesn't have to be um, expensive, but having a little, a little area that draws people in. And I love, I love chairs. I love kind of when people do little front patios in their, uh, in their yard, because you put a couple of chairs there and it just looks nice. You know, it just feels, feels like you want to be there, even if you don't have the time to, to spend there. Pots, like you guys were talking about, pots are, are awesome. Um, 
they do have some maintenance. You just need to keep them watered, but uh, a really easy way to add add color um, to your community. Um, you know, things like uh, I think you were talking about doing, you know, somebody doing uh, bell peppers and stuff. Uh, another easy way to kind of add a little structure is doing planters, like bigger planters on the bottom. Those are just uh, water troughs that you can get at um, Tractor Trailer Supply or whatever. They're like 250 bucks. I use those in my in my yard. We use those in a lot of client yards because they're pretty inexpensive, but they're an easy way to really quickly add something interesting. And the same goes to true with other kind of garden elements. So. We actually use these two in the upper left as those uh, culverts. Those are also kind of cheap. You have to call the culvert company and say, hey, can I get two feet of this one and four feet of this one? But can add kind of a cool, um, distinctive look. I can see that being super cool by the time. Um, and then other types of planters. There's a wood planter on the top and then a Corten steel planter. And those are called obelisk in the lower left. You know, you can imagine that kind of just giving a little height and you plant a clematis on it and um, is a really cool feature. So I zipped through it. Sorry. You want you want to you want to talk some yard stuff, some lawn stuff? Some what? You want you want to touch on your lawn stuff? I can be I can be shorter with mine. Um I think we could open it up to lawn um, if people have questions about lawn. Does anyone have any burning questions about lawn maintenance? Because otherwise, I've got a couple of slides as well on some community beautification stuff. I don't have any questions about lawn, but I have questions about filling in a boulevard space with with flowering plants. And I love the idea of the um, Amsonia. Yeah. I've also thought about putting in um, like some heather, for example, but also i i need something like the amsonia that can take salt in the winter that you um a lot of times when the road gets uh plowed in the winter that's where the mountain of snow tends to be in yeah my always yeah kind of how to fill in those kinds of spaces not so much with grass but maybe with something like lily of the valley or something in that regard yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, so Lily of the Valley put in a, a category of plant that um, is an aggressive spreader. It doesn't play well with other plants. Um, the, but that type of plant can be ideal in a, in a space like a boulevard that is bordered and it can't go anywhere. Um, and so you could put it there. Lily Valley is a super tough plant. Sometimes looks kind of awful in the fall, you know, kind of gets that burnt. Um, look so that's kind of maybe it's Achilles heel. Um, on the taller side uh, gooseneck uh, clethra or gooseneck uh, what is that called? Clethra I guess. Uh, it's a really great plant. It would be bad in a garden but uh, but great when you can let it go. Um, but yeah that uh, that Amsonia blue ice um, is going to get about 18 inches tall. It's going to be a really good plant for that as long as it gets some sun. The other one would be a still be Pumilla, P-U-M-I-L-A. The one thing that's important to know about plants um, is that you can't just go by it's an a still be and therefore it's good or it's an a still be therefore it's bad. A still be Pumilla is probably the only a still be that is a really, really good, just awful spot garden or landscape plant. Um, there wouldn't be any other a still be that would do that. Um, and so it's really important to know which one of any given plant. So, Jason, do you do you have a list of plants like by shade or sun or that that you might be able to share with folks? We can definitely share our our plant sale um, stuff, which is categorized that way. That'd be great. Yeah. What I was going to say too is two things that I would put out there, you know, ongoing. If anybody is interested, um, is I would definitely be willing if anybody wanted, you know, was interested in doing a, a, a sign planting or whatever, that I would design it for you. If you send me some pictures and stuff, I would design it for $100. And if you wanted us to supply plants, we could do that too. Um, and then also, if there's any uh, park that was 
interested, we, it's part of that uh, autonomous collective. One of our b pr biggest problems has been actually finding places to plant trees. Um, and it, which seems kind of funny, but uh, since we were focusing on kind of homeowner places, we had, we had a very easy time raising money. We had a very easy time finding volunteers. We had a hard time finding places to plant. So if there's any park that, you know, is interested, I'm sure that I could motivate, you know, a, a group to do a volunteer planting of 25 trees. That's and you can awesome. just contact, you can just contact me about that. Um, Jason at fieldoutdoorspaces.com. That's awesome. I, that's a, that's a deal y'all for a, for a professional design of your sign planting. Um, so, and we'll definitely, I know that we've got several co-ops that weren't able to join us for the call tonight, Jason, um, but we'll also put that out there um, in some of the follow-ups yeah. uh, with some of the other co-ops that missed with the recording of the, um, of the discussion tonight. We'll also share that with folks. Great. Um, and I, you know, I don't wanna rush the conversation into, this, into the slides that I have, so I'm honestly like, I think that we should just continue having a discussion about plantings. The stuff that I was gonna talk about was like signage and things like that, which I can easily put into a cooperator article and share that at a different time. It's less, um, it's definitely less interesting. And since we've got an expert here with us, I'd like to reserve the rest of the uh, like 10 or so minutes that we have if folks have additional questions that they wanna ask about landscape design. It's not, it's not even, you, you got to remember too that fencing comes into beautification as well. If you yeah. drive down Fireside, you see our fence that was built in 1972, how horrible it looks right now. And then part of it, we put in $6,000 worth of new Sims Tech fencing, which is graffiti free fencing. Oh, nice. And as you go the rest of the way, it's awful. It's just awful. It's falling over and it's been graffitied on and it's got two coats of whatever color we could come up with to hide the graffiti because the police tagged us and said, clean it up. It was, oh, no. it's a horrible mess. So in beautification, you have to include the fencing. And then what do you do with the boulevard? So we're working with the city of Fridley right now to get some lighting, but it would be really nice to have, you know, the opportunity to plant some trees down that border, like the color yeah. trees that stay colored throughout the year. Um, and then worry about that as well, because that's part of your community too, is that boulevard there. And you're gonna definitely get an email from us. We're all like, our eyes are big and wide. Anyway, Good, that sounds fun. So love some beautification around our signage. You know, every year we change it up a little bit, but it would be nice to have a design done for the, the main entrance, which is on Highway 65. So fun. everybody. That sounds great. Yeah, so we'll send you an email. Right yeah. away. One of the things that Jason and I talked about when we met first about the structure of this session was just about how many, like how much sheer acreage and space you all have in your communities to do planting. Um, and that it's just one of the things that we just don't talk about enough um, as one of the ways to, you know, it's just really it's super low cost. And, and since I've been driving through a lot of communities trying to find opportunities to do more conversions of, of uh, communities to co-ops I've driven so different I've driven through so many communities and one of the things that stand, has stood out to me in the difference between a, a community that really like see things feels inviting and feels like a place that you would want to live or maybe move a new home in I know that's what everyone that's the topic I got in everyone's mind is planting I mean if they have if they've had some even just a, a you know a, a nice attempt at doing some you know some different types of height of trees and shrubs and, and perennial plantings, it makes a phenomenal difference in, in the curb appeal uh, for the community. And, you know, I, yeah, so I'm just, I'm super jazzed about this conversation because I think our, I think all of our co-ops have just like the sky's the limit for, you know, what they can do to really improve the, the curb appeal with, with plantings and with plantings that over time will, be relatively maintenance low, you know, and maintenance free, you know, as they, as they mature and they get larger. Um, and they just make such a huge difference. So I'm excited for Park Plaza and Camel Creek. If it's an incredible see. asset too. Yeah. You look at those pictures and just how much space. Yeah. It's great. What other questions are there? 
So now I have a question for you. Um, when we were um, put on city water, we have a we had a hill um, coming into one of the entrances exits for the park. Well, they shaved it down vertical, so we can no longer mow it, and we just have a horrible mess like this there, and it's yeah. it's a huge space. Um, you know, taking into um, mind that this is clay. What kind of ground cover can we put out there that's um, drought resistant, you know, probably no more than six inches tall, something we, you know, we can't mow. So it's got to be something that's a, a really good ground cover that looks nice. What's the, um, uh, what's the sun exposure? How much sun does it get? All the time. It's a lot of sun, all sun. It's right off from a highway, so it's, there's it's no a, shade at all. It's a bank off the road, so the highway literally comes right down. It's a sheer drop. <clears throat> um, yeah, some part of it is is cost. You know, I mean, it, you know, it, it doesn't sound like an area that you could plant, so now you're limited to what you could seed. Um, seeding, I mean, I think it, that you get into. Um, at six inches, you know, is pretty low. The plant that you'd love to do there would be, you know, what we call no-mo, um, no-mo fescue blend. No-mo fescue blend is, is nice. It takes a little bit of establishment um, to get it going and making sure it doesn't have too many weeds in it. Um, but it doesn't love like full, full, full sun. And so yeah. it might be that Ideally, I mean, I don't know how how steep your tie. I mean, is it? Could you plant? I mean, you could plant some shrubs on there. No, I, I don't think so. It's it's pretty. Uh, you know, it's pretty straight up and down. They took over half um, of our actually, hill. Actually, the the other thing is planting um, vines on it. Yeah. Um, so planting. Uh, out that way. Like woodbine, um, which is a which is a plant that would kind of grow there anyway. But vines do great as trailers. They call that a trailer when a vine actually grows on the ground. Um, I've had clients that grow ivy and you know stuff, and they actually do really well that way. I mean, it it's going to take it a little bit to get it going. I mean, you'd probably have to um, either what you'd be afraid of is whatever plant community is there. I don't know if it's dirt right now or what, but I mean, there's going to be a plant community that kind of establishes in it. You'd want to make yeah. sure that it doesn't take the moisture and sun away from the vine. The vine will grow over the top of whatever is, is there pretty fast, uh -huh. but you still need to make sure that the other stuff doesn't kind of get over the top of it right away. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it would be still kind of expensive and might take a little bit. I mean, that'd be the disadvantage is that, um, you still be planting plants. So I mean, vines you could probably get in smaller, um, smaller containers or whatever, and kind of. But it'd be pretty expensive still over a big, big area. Yeah, maybe we yeah, could be we planting. Could, um, is, is planting a yeah, I'll take a picture of it and show you what we're talking about, and then you can kind of um, see it's just it's just straight up and down. I mean, it um, also could be that you plant a a low maintenance lawn mix, you know, or fes mid-height fescue blend, um, you know, with a mat and everything. And then it might be that uh, once a year or something, it just needs to be weed whacked or something. You can't even get to it to do that. I mean, you can do the bottom and you can get part of the top, but you can't get the middle. <laughs> <laughs> It's, yeah, it's just that, too, that mid, um, a mid height like a sheep's fescue or something actually might do all right there because it'll it'll actually flop over. Oh, okay. So I don't even know if it's gonna feel like it's taller than it still might, yeah. it might feel like it's twelve inches tall, but it's gonna flop over. Jason, could they do the no mo grass? Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, I think that you could you could do it. What I'm afraid with the no mo that we use is we find that when you get too much sun. It has a really hard time establishing. Um, and so I think you might be better off with a little, I mean, I would, uh, a lawn company like Twin Cities Seed, they, that's a seed company and they're in Edina. Um, if you get sent them kind of the specific 
they would probably give you a blend that makes sense. But I think it might be a slightly different um, thing than what we call no mow because I think it might be too much sun. Yeah. yeah but I think a sheep's fescue or something. Yeah. We're having problems trying to find something that looks nice, you know, and um, that's, you know, one of the, it's right next to the visitor's area. So it's something that we want you know, to look nice. I uh, started out with, you know, thinking clover, but it doesn't have a strong enough root. Um, yeah, yeah, clover is hard, and it and it has bad times of the year too, where it just like is completely wiped out. I think you might get some erosion um, with it. Um, you know, one uh, one trick, you know, could be to to do some sort of structure. I mean, planters or you know something that are kind of stuck in, you know. Yeah. Yeah, iteratively in there, they would take the pressure off the plant community. Yeah, we were thinking tires. Um, we saw <laughs> yeah a, a photo of a, a, a you know a landscape guy he, or whatever he did a hill that's exactly like ours, but he put a bunch of tires, oh, sure. tires in there, and filled the middle with plants, and it yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah, and there are systems for that too. I mean, there's log systems. Um, so, I mean, this would be similar to the tire, but they would kind of go away over time. Is So there's plantable log systems that you could plant across, horizontally across, and then plant things in the logs and that they would actually grow. It's not the cheapest thing, um, but it would be a solution. Does that make sense? They're yeah. kind of like filled they're filled with kind of a compost blend and then you actually uh -huh. can just plant straight into that that log okay so there are solutions to that yeah the thing is is that we don't want anything that, that the kids can climb on that's another yeah um you know a problem because if it sticks out and they can climb on it they're going to be on it low growing shrub might work too i mean um low grow sumac is a plant that grows three feet tall or whatever um, is really good generally in really bad situations and really good at erosion control. Oh, okay. Sumac? Yep. Okay. I'll have to look into that. Oh. Thank you. Well, we are at the end of the, the time for this session. We wrapped it up really quick. If, if folks have additional questions, um, uh, you know, feel free to forward them to NCF staff and, um, you know, we can forward them along to Jason or, you know, find other resources for you. But Jason, I just want to thank you so much for joining us. This has been excellent. We've been fun. thinking, yeah, we've been thinking about doing something like this with our, with our co-op leaders for a long time. So it's finally come to fruition. We've, hopefully this is the first of many conversations that we have about beautification through landscape design and planting. Um, well, I, lo I love to help out many times. It's very fun. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Emily, do you have any closing things that you want to mention? Or I'll say that I'll send out an email after this that will include Jason's PowerPoint. Um, do I have that on the drive, Tori, or is that something I should get from Jason? I could send it to you. Yeah, What's the you best way to do that? Um, I'll I'll send you an email, but it's Emily at NorthCountryFoundation.org. So okay. awesome. Um, so I can send that out, and then also the session will be recorded, and then we'll put that up, and I'll let you guys know when that gets uploaded on to the cloud. So thank you, Jason, again. I learned so much as well yeah, because I lo I learned a load. <laughs> this is I have a great. question. Do you do webinars at all, Jason? I love doing webinars, actually. You know, obviously this year has been kind of a uh, trial by fire with uh, webinars, but uh, um, I love it. It's a, it's a great format. It's so easy. Why were you, why were, did you have a specific ask to do that? <laughs> well, I was, I was asking if he offers any webinars with any of his stuff that he does or. I don't have any like uh, package webinars, if that's the question. Okay. Yeah, it is. But we should, we should have some webinars on, on different planting and stuff like that. That would be super awesome to do that. Yeah, we're definitely working on things in that, in that uh, direction. Um, 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely update you if there's anything that we have. Great, thanks. All right, right cool. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, Pat.